Boom. All right, you ready, Ted? Yeah. All as right. Ready as I'll ever be. Let's do it. So good afternoon for those people on the East Coast. Good morning for folks on the West Coast. I'm here with Ted Samuel, the Deputy Director at mm -hmm. Oberlin Shansi. He's got a PhD in anthropology. He is a badass human who I met because we um, were both trip leaders for Putney Student Travel one summer and he does this incredible dance that you'll learn about today and that he'll actually read you a little excerpt from his story um, and he he did a story for dance adventures the anthology which is coming out soon and this again to set the context is the second of our author interviews for the book and the book will be available for pre-order starting september 19th we're very excited about that and I love the encouraging nodding. <laughs> um, and yeah, let's get this party started. So Ted, <laughs> is there any I, you want to be introduced? <laughs> yeah, I think you did a fantastic job, better than I probably would have done. So <laughs> cool. well, for those people who don't know, what is Karagatam? It's, you know, this is a dance you love. Yeah, it's a dance that I'll be quite honest, I didn't know a whole lot about until I started learning it. Um, it is a Tamil folk dance. Um, and one of the most identifying features of it is that the performer balances a brass pot on, on their head. Um, and uh, this can sometimes happen with some choreography, but there's a lot of improv that happens in it as well. And um, there's all of these almost circus like feats of balance or stunts um, in, in Tamil Nadu, sometimes they call them events, um, which, uh, you know, they deal with uh, all kinds of scary, scary things like fire, ladders, needles. Um, it's, it's very much a, a salt of the earth kind of entertainment. It's often pretty humorous. And it's not widely known outside of Tamil communities or outside of Indian communities. So, uh, I consider myself really lucky to have had the chance to not only learn it, but to be able to perform it um, internationally. Yeah, I remember I was so surprised when I read your story because you mentioned, of course, um, that it is the salt of the earth dance and that it allowed you to bring out your buffoonish stage presence. And I was like, that's so interesting because I, when I think of dances from India, you know, I go to the stereotypes, a lot of the stereotypes, which, you know, sometimes if we're dancing Bhangra, it's like really fun, enthusiastic, or if you're dancing some of the more traditional dances, like it seems like it, it's more serious. So, you know, what do you think it was about the culture there that produced this dance? What do you think makes it so unique? Well, I think that, you know, in Tamil Nadu, you have, you know, your highly manicured, highly curated dances like Bharatanatyam that, you know, were at one time reserved for temple spaces, but now pretty much take the stage. This is an entirely different direction. And, it, it, you know, there are different classes and different castes of people. And this tends to be uh, a dance that's more in tune with agrarian societies. That doesn't mean that it hasn't gotten, um, you know, recognition outside of those agrarian sites. But that's kind of where it started. Um, and I actually write a little bit about it in, in the story. And uh, it's actually in my piece that I'll be reading later. So um, maybe I'll save a little bit of it for, for later. Yeah, good foreshadowing. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> cool. And for you, um, what made Karagatam a special access point to the local culture? So what did you experience through that dance that you might not otherwise have experienced while you were living in Mother I India. Yeah. Well, I think performance has been a big part of my life, regardless of where I've been. So for me, performance has been a way of, you know, accepting and sometimes reinterpreting aspects of my own identity. Um, so that's been happening long before I even stepped foot in India. Um, so uh, one of the things that I had been really fascinated by was uh, the idea of learning an Indian performance art just felt very meaningful to me at the time. Um, this story was, you know, really chronicling events that happened in 2003 when I was studying abroad in college. You do the math, that's how old I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> but with that said, you know, uh, I had done my share of variety shows and musical theater, but I never felt something that attached me to my brownness, if you will. And um, that was something that I was really craving. Um, in addition to learning the language, which I did not speak growing up. I learned it in a classroom and then I, I 
got much better at it in India. Um, so for me, I wanted to learn an art form. And then the idea of performing Bharatanatyam really did appeal to me. And I actually did study some Bharatanatyam at the time. Mm -hmm. But that is a dance that really does take a very, very long time to master. Um, in order to become competent in Bharatanatyam, you, you have to give yourself at least a year of intensive study. And then people who go to become more professional dancers to their R&G that's a multi-year commitment. And I had one year abroad, <laughs> so I decided to study multiple dance forms. And Karagatam is just the one that I took to the most quickly um, because it did have uh, a lighter element to it. It did allow for, um, you know, uh, that buffoonish stage presence that that I had talked about, and it allowed for improv as well. Um, you know, in high school, I was always a pretty good actor, a pretty good entertainer, but dance was never something that I considered myself to be very good at. And this art form almost gave me a little bit of leeway to improv when I needed to. And it gave me, you know, confidence to move my bodies in certain ways um, that I had never really experienced before. Um, and I became more confident with my ability to move and move well than I ever had before. And, it, you know, obviously I'm balancing brass pot on my head the entire time. So that does restrict movement a little bit. But I wasn't so reliant on uh, a rigid choreography that I would fear forgetting. Mm. Um, I could really just let my personality take over and uh, kind of dominate the stage on my own terms. I like how mischievous you look as you talk about <laughs> it. It's like a little twinkle in your eye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. So, um, Oh yeah. So the other thing I thought was really great about your story is typically when people, when, and I'll just say like people like me, cause I only know my perspective, like white Americans think about India. We think about the Taj Mahal. We think about Delhi. We think about maybe the golden triangle, you know, and your story takes place in this um, part of Southern India in mm -hmm. Tamil Nadu, which I'm, sh how do you pronounce it? You pronounce it the right way. Yeah, Tamil Nadu. You okay. got it. Great, Tal Nadu, um, in a city called Madurai. Again, am I pronouncing that correctly? Great, perfect. Um, and it was so cool to read about the city that you know I'd never heard about before. Could you just share with the people who are watching a few things that are near and dear to you from that place in India specifically? Absolutely. Um, Madurai is a place that I call my second home at this point. The story takes place in 2003 during my first year abroad there. Um, but since then, I've managed to spend six years of my adult life and my career in Mother Eye. Um, I, I did a Fulbright Research Fellowship there um, soon after this uh, took place. Um, and then uh, I, I went back for research for my, my PhD. Uh, I also did an American India Foundation Clinton Fellowship. Um, where I worked with a human rights organization there. And then I ran a study abroad organization there for three years. Um, so I, I'm writing about a time when I was a study abroad student, but I kind of went full circle and I was the person running uh, a different program, but still running a program um, in, in South India. So um, for me, uh, there's just a sense of familiarity that um, Mother Eye gives to me that it, it is a second home. Um, Mother Eye is an incredible place. Uh, it, um, a lot of people who know about Mother Eye know about the Meenakshi Amman Temple. It is one of the largest temple complexes that is like still active in, in the world. Um, it has amazing architecture uh, and it, I would highly recommend it. Um, I believe that it was a semi-finalist for the Modern Wonders of the World uh, a competition that happened. I don't even know how many years ago at this point. Um, Mother Eye, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm obsessed with food, so, um, mm, oh, there we go, yes, you can see the Minakshi Temple there. Is it, are these, is it just this one, or it looks like there's a few temples? So that's one Gopuram, so the temple has many of those towers wow. that we see there. Um, and some towers are more ornate than others, and some of them are different sizes, because this wasn't all built at one time. Different gopurams were built at different times at the temple. And just the architecture um, that is there, I mean, it is distinctly South Indian. Wow. Um, so you can see like all of the different sculptures that are there. So a lot of people know Mother Eye for, for the temple. Um, but what I would say is uh, another thing that you should know Mother Eye for is the food. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed with food. 
And <laughs> honestly, uh, some of the best eating I've ever done in my life. I mean, there's a reason I spent six years there and it wasn't just because of the temple. In fact, I, I would only go to the temple on rare occasions, you know, but uh, I ate every day and I ate well. Um, and honestly, uh, there's uh, just a number of different communities that I became, you know, part of. Um, which is something that, you know, I talk about in my story as longing for. And I almost wish, you know, I could give you this epilogue of what happened after the fact, you know, in terms of my relationship to mother. I talk about my relationship to Karagatam and the dance. Um, but yeah, my relationship to mother I has only grown, even in my current position. We're partnered with an organization in Mother Eye right now. So I get to go to Mother Eye, I mean, obviously when there's not a pandemic, I get to go to Mother Eye uh, approximately once a year still um, for professional reasons. Um, it, it's a city that has a, a deep family connection for me as well. My father went to Mother Eye Medical College in, in, in the early 60s. My aunt was a professor at a, a university in Mother Eye, and my grandmother's father is from Mother Eye. So to me, this is a city that, you know, um, I have been able to really feel in a living sense right now, but have a deep familial connection to that goes back generations. Mm, I love that. That is so special. And what, if you could only eat one dish from Mother Eye for the rest of your life, what would that one dish be? Oh, it would not be good for my waistline, but like, let's not talk about that. Let's just pretend it has zero <laughs> calories. All food in Mother Eye has zero calories. There's a dish called um, kotu parota. It is um, a, a very type of bread that, like, it's a very flaky bread almost, but it's a flat bread. Imagine a croissant, but a little bit more dense. Mm. They take that and then they chop it up really small and then they fry it with onions, with an egg and a bunch of different spices. And it is one of the most rich but balanced dishes that you will ever taste in your life. Like my mouth is watering right now <laughs> just thinking about it because it, it's just so incredibly good. It has, you know, it, it'll have, you know, cumin, fennel, um, curry leaf in it. Um, it's just so flavorful. But, but you know, that, that rich bread just, ah, it just brings it all home. Um, yeah, I need to get some at some point. I, I can't find it very easily in the U.S. Um, so I mean, I gotta work on that. Yeah, as you were talking, I was like, mm, talk spices to me. <laughs> 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 well, I feel like you've painted the picture of this incredible place pretty well, although I'm sure to actually do it justice, we'd have to talk for hours and hours and hours. Very true. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to read us an excerpt from the incredible story that you contributed. Thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I chose a little expert which actually talks a little bit more about the dance, you know? Um, I, I guess I don't have the privilege of being able to talk about a dance that's easily recognizable to non-Indian, non-Thamal audiences. So I, I chose the uh, excerpt that, you know, in the concisest way possible, talks a little bit about the dance and why I chose it. Um, to give a little bit of context, um, uh, the study abroad program that I did was through the University of Wisconsin, and they had um, an opportunity, and yeah, it was a requirement, but I'm going to call it an opportunity. <laughs> um, they had the opportunity um, to take classes in some kind of cultural art form. That could have been um, anything from local pottery making to sari weaving um, to, uh, you know, different forms of, uh, you know, local martial arts um, and uh, folk arts and also Bharatanatyam was a possibility. And um, yeah, uh, that I knew that I wanted to do some kind of performance art for sure. So that's uh, kind of where I'm starting. Uh, so here we go. Having been an avid comedic performer in high school plays and variety shows, I knew I wanted to study a South Indian performance art that would let me capitalize on my buffoonish stage presence, allow me to explore local cultural dynamics of artists and communities, and broaden my skills as an entertainer. The answer was Karagatam, a Tamil folk art in which the performer is required to balance a decorated brass pot on their head while dancing and sometimes executing circus-like stunts that could incorporate fire, ladders, and literal pins and needles. Karagatam has a long history in Tamil Nadu and has evolved significantly over the centuries. Religious iterations of the art form, known as Shakti Karagatam, 
were historically reserved for ceremonial offerings to the goddess Mariamun. However, in the early 20th century, a secular version of the dance, Atakar Gautam, emerged with the popularization of Tamil film and regional folk arts. Whereas highly manicured classical Indian dances like Bharatanatyam gained national and international recognition, Karagatam maintained its popularity among local agrarian communities. The dance was not relegated to formal stages or the inner sanctums of temples. It could be performed in public open air venues like village squares and marketplaces. My inspiration for learning the art form had come from the hit Tamil movie Karagatakaran, a romantic comedy that depicted the courtship between two Karagatam performers from neighboring villages. I had watched the 1989 blockbuster in my Tamil class in Madison, Wisconsin, prior to the UW program. Though I only understood about 50% of the plot, the musical numbers had drawn me in. The punchy drum beats and the fast paced melodies laid the backdrop for energetic choreography in which the dancers integrated comple complex footwork, droll facial expressions, and precise uninterrupted balance. Karagatam, as depicted in this movie, left little room for subtlety. It was fun, it was entertaining, it was quirky. The movie planted a seed and I began to explore the possibility of enrolling in a Karagatam tutorial through the University of Wisconsin program. Through online research and conversations with the program staff after I arrived in India, I learned that the dance allowed space for improvisation. Having been less than perfect at learning choreography during my heyday in high school musicals, I was intrigued by the freedom that Karagatam could afford. I also found out that some dancers incorporated humor and playful lewdness as evidenced by routines that featured not so coy acts of chopping phallic fruits and vegetables like bananas, carrots, and cucumbers. Karagatam appealed to my comedic instincts in a way that few other dance styles would. Furthermore, given its relatively low profile outside of India, this study abroad program offered the opportunity to learn an art form that most Americans would not have even had the chance to watch. Oh, so good, so good. I love, I love your story so much. It's, um, I, don't, I don't think you know this. Have you gotten your copy of the book yet? I haven't opened it because you told good. me not to. Good, good. <laughs> I, I have gotten the copy. Well, we decided to start the book with your story because it was just so lovely and it made me laugh and it was just, I just loved it so much. And I loved all the stories. They're like children, you know, like I like <laughs> my favorites, but as we were talking about which story to open with, it was like, it just seemed like the right one. And for all these reasons, like it's so educational, it's so um, it's so sweet and it's so close to your heart and it's so funny. Like, it's just a great, a great story. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, this exercise was really good for me to really, uh, this is one of the unfortunate things about becoming an adult, a quote unquote adult. And I need to work on my definition of adult. I get it. But, you know, I haven't been able to perform Karagatam as much in the past five years as I would have liked. Mm. And I think this helped me kind of rediscover that, that, that passion that I had for it. Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, you know, uh, nine to five jobs, they, they, they sometimes make things a little difficult. And with a pandemic happening and me working in international education, it's been more of like a seven to seven job. <laughs> um, but with that said, um, it does give me something to strive for. So I, I thank you for this opportunity. And um, for anyone who's out there, I'm also excited to read the other stories. Um, I, I'm really excited for Kara Nepomuseno, uh, um, who's actually someone I work with. Um, Kara's one of the fellows on the fellowship program that I run. And it's really awesome to see a young dancer's voice, especially another person of color being featured in this. And I thank you for that because I do think that, you know, young scholars of dance are looking for opportunities like this to not have to reiterate academic jargon, but to be able to talk about their experience in a way that is real to and accessible to people who are outside of the academy. Um, so thank you for that. And for all of you who are interested in dance, like this is one of those things where you can learn a lot. But at the same time, it's not going to overwhelm you with technical terms. Um, because if you want that, there are other publications out there for it. Plenty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. It's part of the, it's part of the secret vision of, 
and now not so secret since we're saying it live on a recording that, um, you know, that I take this into universities and work with students and, and help them write their own stories because you're right. For all of us, we have these incredibly beautiful experiences and they're beautiful memories for us. And yet when we can reflect on them and capture them, we typically squeeze out even more wisdom for ourselves. And we get to hold that story in a different way and share it with the world in a different way that's really meaningful. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Ted. It was such a delight to interview you. No problem. I can't wait to, to see you tomorrow and for, us, for you and the other authors to open your books. Fingers crossed. I'm so excited. I don't know why my fingers are crossed. I already have the book. I already know it's out. But fingers crossed anyway. No, need more luck fingers right crossed for this to, to go as global as it deserves to go. Awesome. All right. All right.